So today's video is going to be the start of a brand new series on my channel. If you follow me on social media, you will know exactly what's about to happen. This week, we are doing Valen Crimes Part 2. Last year, I did a week of true crime videos over the week of Valentine's Day, all Valentine's themed. And this year, we're doing a part two. We're doing it again. So from today up until Sunday, there will be a video out every single day a true crime video relating to Valentine's Day in some way. So I hope you're excited for the next week on my channel. But today we're going to be talking about our first solved case in a long, long time. In fact, this case I have been researching since before Christmas. And I've just had to keep pushing it back because the other ones were taking priority, such as the current missing persons cases. And this is actually a channel member suggested case, but you probably don't even remember suggesting this case to me. But thank you to TG Glimmer for suggesting this so long ago. So today we're going to be talking about Shanda Shera, who was a 12 year old girl. And I just want to give a warning now that this is a very heavy case. I will give a warning closer to the time where things get very intense so that you can skip ahead but if you just don't like cases involving children at all then I suggest that you click out. But yeah quickly before I get into this I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So Shanda Renee Shara was a 12 year old girl born on June 6, 1979 in Kentucky, USA. When Shanda was still young her parents Stephen and Jacqueline divorced and Shanda moved with her mother to Louisville where a stepfather eventually came into the picture. Shanda was a very energetic, sporty girl. Any kind of athletic opportunity, activity, sport that was offered to her, she took it. She was a cheerleader, she was on both the softball and volleyball teams and took part in other sports kind of more casually on the side, including baseball, basketball, gymnastics. And then in June of 1991, Shanda's mother Jacqueline divorced Shanda's stepfather and she and her mother moved to Indiana where Shanda then enrolled in Hazelwood Middle School. Her first few days at this school went really well. She was making friends, she was fitting in, she was doing really well. But then around the third day, something happened. Shanda was speaking to one of her new friends at this school who told Shanda that she'd recently broken up with a boyfriend, but she still had this ring that he'd given her and she wanted to give him it back, but she couldn't do it herself. And Shanda, eager to make friends with this new girl, she wanted to impress her, she wanted to get on a good side, she said, I'll do it for you, I'll take this ring back to your ex-boyfriend. And so Shanda took this ring to this boy and as you can imagine, he was not very happy and he kind of took that out on Shanda rather than his ex-girlfriend that had given him the ring back. And just then, as he began shouting at Shanda, his cousin walked past, who was two years older. This older cousin was 14-year-old Amanda Heverin. She was two years older than Shanda and she was quite a tomboy. She was known throughout the school as being quite hard. She was able to handle herself. So this boy got his cousin Amanda involved and Amanda started shouting at Shanda, who was two years younger than her, saying that she shouldn't be getting involved and then she pushed Shanda against a wall. Teachers came and broke up this altercation and Shanda was fine. She had a bump on her head but other than that she was fine and Amanda was completely unscathed. The two of them were put into a week of detention together for this fight even though it was very one-sided. I don't think that was fair at all but through this week of detention instead of continuing to fight and arguing and hating each other Shanda and Amanda actually became friends. So much so that after this week of detention was up, the two of them began spending time outside of school together and Jacqueline, Shanda's mother, was not happy. This was the girl that was two years older than her daughter that had beaten her up. But Shanda defended her to her mother saying, no, she's not normally like that. She was just defending her cousin. Amanda's actually really nice. So Shanda's mother, Jackie, just kind of reluctantly accepted Amanda as Shanda's new friend. If Shanda was happy, then so was Jackie, but she was still very kind of wary about Amanda. As the days went on, the girls got to know each other more and more, and eventually Shanda found out that Amanda had an on-again, off-again relationship with an older girl. This girl was 16-year-old Melinda Loveless. She was two years older than her on-again, off-again girlfriend Amanda, 
making her four years older than 12 year old Shanda. And at this point when Amanda met Shanda, she and Melinda were kind of over. They'd been in this on again off again relationship since Amanda was 13 and Melinda was 15 and the two of them had just kind of grown apart. They never officially ended things but Melinda began seeing older girls, so Amanda just kind of assumed that they had ended. Melinda Loveless had a hectic home life, disapproving parents and multiple different mental illnesses, which meant that this relationship with Amanda was very hard to maintain so young. Those kind of problems when you're so young are hard to come to terms with by yourself, never mind when they're affecting a relationship. Melinda's father, Larry, was unfaithful to her mother and he began to resent Melinda's mother. So much so to the point where he began physically, verbally and sexually abusing her, sometimes in front of Melinda and her two sisters. Melinda and her sisters would often go hungry and without basic necessities because her father Larry, as soon as he got paid, he would spend all of his money on firearms and alcohol and cars. And Larry would also abuse his three daughters, including Melinda, although it's unclear to what extent he abused them. And it's unclear because each of the girls tell the story differently. Some of them hate him and want to tell everything whereas some of them really want to defend him they love him they say he never did anything like that we know to some extent that something definitely did happen he was eventually arrested for it and everything but we don't truly know exactly what happened the girl's mother marjorie claimed that he sexually abused all three of them since birth and would do inappropriate things to them while he was changing their nappies both of melinda's older sisters say that he molested them all the way through their childhood however melinda maintains that he never did anything like that although she does admit that he did sleep in the same bed as her up until she was 14. For 14 years he stayed in the same bed as his daughter rather than his wife and he did that up until she was 14 because that was when he abandoned the family. Had he not abandoned the family he probably would have stayed in Melinda's bed and although she admits that he did sleep in her bed she says that he never touched her, he never molested her, he never did anything like that. Melinda's mother Marjorie often caught Larry peeking at the girls inappropriately all the way through all of their childhoods and one time he was peeking on Melinda and her friend and Marjorie saw him and attacked him with a knife. He was hospitalised for those injuries at the time and eventually divorced Marjorie when Melinda was 14 years old. Larry moved away to Florida and remarried and he would keep in touch with the girls via letters although Melinda never forgave him for abandoning her and her sisters and her mother and it was around this time when her father left that Melinda began the relationship with Amanda so everything was very very fresh and her family didn't approve of her being with another girl. Her mother was furious actually, she wouldn't speak to her for a long long time and when she would speak to her she would scream horrible things at Melinda. Eventually her mother accepted Melinda as gay but Melinda had so many other problems than that. She had depression, she had her emotional scarring from childhood, everything was so fresh at this point as well. She had counselling, there was talk of medication and Melinda was just a very troubled girl. Melinda began behaving erratically, she would get into fights, she would skip school, just generally misbehaving which her counsellor put down to a depression. And Melinda and Amanda were never really right for each other, they would break up like every week, get back together like the day after, like there was, they weren't right for each other. And they did this for just over a year, they were very on again off again for a full year until Melinda like I said began seeing older girls and it was around that time when Melinda started seeing these other people that Shanda transferred to Hazelwood Middle School and Amanda took a liking to her and the two of them kind of began forming a relationship. Shanda when she began speaking to Amanda had only ever liked boys in her life. She was only 12, she hadn't really had time to explore her sexuality and Amanda knew that. She knew that Shanda had never really given any thought to a romantic relationship with a girl before and Amanda kind of used that to her advantage. Amanda wrote Shanda several different love letters asking how she thought of Amanda, did she think Amanda was good looking, she would overload Shanda with compliments. The two of them began spending more and more time together and eventually in October of 1991 Amanda asked Shanda to be her date to the school dance. Shanda accepted and the two of them went to this dance and everything was great. It was a really nice night. 
that was until towards the end of it when Melinda noticed that Shonda and Amanda were getting kind of close and suddenly jealousy completely overtook Melinda. So Melinda went up to Shonda, a girl four years younger than herself, and told her to stay away from Amanda, otherwise there would be consequences. But Shanda didn't seem deterred by Melinda. She continued her relationship with Amanda and everything was going well until Shanda's family started noticing some changes in her. Shanda began failing all of her classes and Amanda actually taught her how to forge her mother's signature so that she could sign her own report cards and never have to show her mother her bad grades. It was becoming very clear to Shanda's mother Jackie that Amanda Heverin was a bad influence on her daughter Shanda and so she stopped the two of them seeing each other. But of course as many other kids would do in that situation Shanda and Amanda just went behind Jackie's back and continued seeing each other. But this didn't last very long until one day Shanda's mother Jackie checked the mail and found a love letter in there that Shanda had actually meant to write to Amanda. She'd sent this letter by post but forgotten to put a stamp on it and so it came back to their address and that was how her mother found it. So Jackie read this letter and it became very clear from the contents of it that Shanda and Amanda had had an intimate physical relationship and obviously I'm not going to quote anything because these were a 12 year old and a 14 year old girl but there are interviews of her mother quoting certain parts of this letter and it is very clear what their relationship was and Jackie was immediately furious not only because Shanda had gone behind her back and seen this girl when she'd already told her not to but also because she felt like 14 year old Amanda was manipulating 12 year old Shanda. She was taking advantage of her. She felt like her daughter was too young to have had all these thoughts in her head before Amanda came along. And with that, Jackie moved Shanda to a different school. She no longer wanted her around Amanda and clearly her word wasn't powerful enough. So she completely took Shanda away from her. So Shanda started at a Catholic school the following week and before long, her grades were back up. She had a nice group of friends. She was even trying out for the cheerleading squad already. And Jackie had been quoted saying that at that point, she felt like the old Shanda was back. Amanda tried to keep in touch with Shanda by writing these love letters and things but Shanda was just very busy with her new life and this time she was kind of listening to her mother. A few months went by of Shanda ignoring Amanda for the most part. Sometimes she would reply, sometimes she'd pick up the phone, sometimes she'd write back but mostly she was ignoring her. But Amanda just would not stop. She was calling her, she was writing these letters like every week and eventually Shanda had enough. Shanda even wrote a letter to one of her other friends saying that she just wished Amanda would leave her alone and that was how things were for a little while. And then on the morning of January 11th, 1992, a farmer named Don Foley was on his way to a hunting ground to practice shooting when he saw something different on the roadside. As they were driving towards it, it kind of just looked like this big black mass on the side of the road. But as they got out of the car and walked over, they noticed a head, shoulders, a torso. And they got out of the car thinking that this was maybe a mannequin, leftover store mannequin that just hadn't burnt properly in a fire. But as they got up to it, they realised it was the burnt remains of a human body. He called the police and a homicide team was there within minutes to examine the scene and confirm that this was in fact a murder. They quickly assessed this body there at the crime scene. Obviously, it still needed to go to autopsy. But they assessed that this was a female body laying on her back with red blankets wrapped around her, which were also very badly burnt. The victim's arms were straight up in the air with clenched fists, which is often how the body can Kind of forms when it's been burnt. I don't know the science behind it but in a lot of burn victims they are often found like that. There was also an empty Pepsi bottle on the ground by the body and a strong smell of gasoline in the air suggesting that someone had poured gasoline all over this body to help it catch fire intentionally. So while further examinations were going on at the crime scene, police back at the police station were looking through missing women's reports to see if they could find a potential victim. But police quickly realised that there were no young girls reported missing in that area at all at the time and so identifying this victim was going to be a lot harder than they thought. It was immediately clear that whoever had done this to this young girl didn't try to hide it in any way. Maybe they wanted police to see it because there was a huge woods 
just a few feet away from where this body was left. It was left on a kind of grass verge before a road. So there was the road, a grass verge, and then here was a huge woods. Had this person wanted to hide the body, they could have easily hidden it in the woods. So they wanted this body to be found. And that led police to their first theory. In the 1990s, there was a huge obsession with the occult, with black magic, with Satanism, with rituals. It was so prevalent at the time that even law officials were putting out official statements about potential human sacrifices, rituals, like just warning the general public that this was going on. And one of the ways that a human sacrifice would normally end would be to cremate the victim and that looked like what someone was trying to do here. And not far from where this body was found there was an abandoned house that locals nicknamed the Witch's Castle and kids would meet up there often to get drunk, talk about the occult, perform rituals. It was usually like teenagers that were just interested in this, it wasn't like a huge cult meeting point or anything. But still a lot of strange things went on there and so they felt that that was a very strong lead in this. Meanwhile the body was brought in for autopsy and due to the level of burn into this body it was going to be very very hard to identify. It was going to have to be done by dental records but before the body even got to the pathologist to be identified this case took an unexpected turn. At 11.30pm that night a girl walked into a police station 45 miles away from where this body was found claiming to know something about a murder. This girl was 15 year old Tony Lawrence. She was kind of known as the good kid. She was a very normal girl. However, she was very quite troubled. She had a past of sexual assault and rape, which led to her having severe depression. She would self-harm. She even attempted suicide a few times. She wasn't much of a leader. She was quite shy, quite scared. She was more the type to just kind of sit back and watch or follow other people. So Tony was taken for questioning about this huge claim that she knew something about a murder. And she was very visibly nervous. She couldn't string a sentence together. She was shaking, she was crying, and it took her a while to calm down. But when she did, she told police that she was with friends the night before and her friends and her went to the witch's castle and killed a little girl. She said that she didn't know this little girl. She'd never met her before. All she knew was that her first name was Shanda. She didn't know Shanda's surname. She didn't know anything about her. All she knew was that she actually lived 50 miles away in Clark County. So while Tony's questioning went on, police at that police station got in contact with police at Clark County Station and asked if they had any missing girls named Shanda. And almost 12 hours earlier, 12 year old Shanda Shara had been reported missing. She'd been staying over at her father's the night before. Like I said, her mother and her father were actually divorced and so she went to stay with her father every now and again. And she wanted to stay up quite late watching TV that night and so her father said, that's completely fine, just turn off the TV before you go to bed. And he expected her to take herself up to bed. However, when he woke up the next morning at 7 a.m., she wasn't in her bedroom and she also wasn't downstairs. He just kind of assumed that maybe she'd gone out or maybe she was downstairs in the basement, but he didn't immediately panic. He didn't think to go and check. It wasn't until his partner, Shanda's stepmother, woke up and said, where's Shanda? Aren't you worried? It really wasn't like Shanda to do anything like this. I know I keep mentioning it, but she was 12 years old. She was very, very young. She wasn't the type to go out with friends so early in the morning. She wasn't the type to sneak out. She, she'd she never done anything like this before. And so it kind of took someone pointing it out to him for Shanda's father to really panic. And so the two of them, her father and her stepmother, ran to the car, got in and began driving around all the immediate areas, seeing if she was out playing or something. They were driving for hours, but they couldn't find Shanda anywhere. They couldn't find any of her friends or anything. And so they decided to go back to the house and get in contact with Shanda's mother, Jackie, and let her know that Shanda was missing. She quickly got round to Shanda's father's house and immediately, as soon as she walked in the living room, she saw Shanda's handbag on the table and she knew Shanda better than anyone that she never left the room without her handbag. And it was clear to Jackie immediately as soon as she saw that that something was very wrong, that Shanda would never leave the house without that, never mind so early and without telling anyone. So at around 2pm they called the police and reported Shanda as missing and for the rest of the day all three of them were calling 
everyone Shanda knew asking if they'd seen her, if they knew anything. This included all of Shanda's new friends and even her old friends from her old school including Amanda Heverin. Amanda said that she hadn't seen Shanda, she hadn't spoken to her, she knew absolutely nothing. However, the way that she said it, Jackie remembered thinking this girl knows more than she's telling us. But she didn't really focus on it too much, she had hundreds of other people that she could be ringing so she didn't bother to pry too much. So now police had Tony Lawrence in the police station saying that her and her friends murdered a little girl named Shanda and 50 miles away they had a missing little girl named Shanda. So police pretty much knew that they had the right girl before the autopsy even came back, before the identification came back. And so they went to Shanda's father's house where her mother, her stepmother and her father were. They sat them down and all they said to them was Shanda's gone. Which was a very bad choice of words. Shanda's family knew that she was gone. They called the police to report her missing. They knew she was gone. So they asked for clarification. What do you mean by gone? And so the officer just said to them, your child has been murdered. And not long after that, the dental records did confirm that the body was that of Shanda Shera. At this point, Shanda's mother Jackie was in so much of a state that she couldn't bear to hear how Shanda had been killed, so they just didn't tell her. Police told her father and her stepmother, however, her mother Jackie didn't want to hear that just yet. The way that she found out what had happened to her 12 year old daughter was the next morning she turned on the news and the news reporter talked about 12 year old Shanda Shera that had been burned alive. And they knew that Shanda had been burned alive because she actually had sucked inside of her lungs, meaning that she'd been breathing or trying to breathe while the flames were going and while smoke was being made. So now police continued to get the full story from Tony Lawrence. So on the night of the murder, Tony Lawrence and her friend Hope Rippey, the two of them were both 15 years old, were gonna meet up with an older friend, 17 year old Laurie Tackett, and all three of them were gonna go to a punk rock concert. So before I even get into anything, I just wanna give a little bit of background on Hope Rippey and Laurie Tackett. Hope Rippey also had a very troubled childhood. She also self-harmed just like the other girls, and she was the one that introduced Tony Lawrence to 17 year old Laurie Tackett. Laurie was, as Tony describes, as weird. She was two years older than the other girls and dressed typically very gothic. She was into Ouija boards, she was into the occult, she liked witchcraft and everything like that. She'd show off to friends and claim that she was possessed by a spirit that she called Diana the Vampire. Laurie Tackett also suffered greatly with depression, self-harm, suicidal thoughts, hallucinations, and eventually was diagnosed with BPD, borderline personality disorder. She suffered several suicide attempts, some of which were even in front of her friends, including one time in front of 15 year old Tony Lawrence and Tony actually had to call an ambulance for her friend that was bleeding out in front of her. So on this day, Laurie Tackett goes and picks up Hope Rippey and Tony Lawrence and as soon as they're all in the car together, Laurie turned to Hope and said, have you told Tony yet? And so Tony was like, what, what have you told me? And then Laurie turned to Tony and said, we're gonna kill a little girl tonight. And Tony felt a little bit uncomfortable, but she didn't think for one minute that she was being serious. Laurie always came out with stuff like this. She talked about vampires and the occult and stuff, but she never really went through with these things. So Tony just kind of thought that it was a joke and they set off in this car to go and pick up another friend but a friend that Hope and Tony didn't know. This was a friend of Laurie's and Laurie told the other two girls that this was the girl who wanted to kill the little girl. So they went and they picked up this friend. Well, first they went inside her house. All three of them got changed into this other girl's clothes as she showed them a knife that she was gonna scare the little girl with. And that was her plan. This girl who wanted to kill the little girl told the other three that she only wanted to scare her. She wasn't gonna kill her, she only wanted to teach her a lesson. So all four girls sat in the car and devised a plan and then they set off to Shanda's dad's house. And when they got there, Laurie ordered Tony and Hope to go knock on the door. So Shanda opened this door and saw two girls that she'd never met before. She'd never even seen them before. And these girls said that they were friends of Amanda Heverins, Shanda's ex-girlfriend. They said, Amanda's here, she wants to see you, she misses you. And at this point, it had been months since Shanda had seen Amanda. And so Shanda said, okay, wait, let me go get changed. And Hope went up to Shanda's room with her, helped to pick out an outfit, and then all three of them went back to the car, 
where Laurie Tackett was waiting. So Shanda got in the car in the passenger side seat and she couldn't see Amanda anywhere. Amanda wasn't in the car. So she started asking about her, where is she? And Laurie, who was driving the car, said, she's at the witch's castle. We're all gonna just drive you there and meet her there together. But before they could set off, the fourth friend whose idea this all was, made herself known. This girl had been hiding, laying in wait on the floor of the back seat, waiting for Shanda to kind of put her guard down and then she jumped up. She grabbed Shanda's hair, pulled her head back, put a knife to her throat and said, shut up, bitch. But this fourth passenger wasn't Amanda Hebron, it was 16-year-old Melinda Loveless, Amanda's ex-girlfriend. Melinda held this knife to Shanda's throat the whole drive to the witch's castle and the whole time she was questioning her about her relationship with Amanda, was it sexual, have you done this, have you done that? And in between questions, Laurie would tell urban legends about the witch's castle. She believed that nine witches were burned alive inside there. And when they got to the witch's castle, Melinda and Laurie dragged Shanda out of the car and just onto the floor by the woods where Hope and Tony just kind of walked. Shanda was begging and pleading for them to just leave her alone, for them to take her home, she's sorry, but Laurie produced two pieces of rope, handed one to Melinda, and Melinda tied her ankles while Laurie tied Shanda's wrists. Melinda began taunting Shanda, saying she had really pretty hair, but would she look so pretty if someone was to cut it all off? She began taking Shanda's rings one by one and giving them to each of her friends, and Hope took off Shanda's Mickey Mouse ring and danced to the tune that it made. Meanwhile, Laurie was saying to Shanda all of these urban legends saying that the witch's castle was full of human remains and Shanda's would be next. Laurie then went and got a shirt out of her car, a shirt that had a smiley face on it with a bullet in the head and Laurie set this shirt on fire. But then pretty quickly all the girls kind of began to panic, thinking that this fire was now gonna draw attention to them. What if cars saw it and stopped to see what was going on? And so they dragged Shanda back to the car and set off again. And during this car ride, Shanda was begging them to just take her home, but the humiliation and the torture was only just beginning. And I suggest that you stop listening sometime around here if you are very sensitive to this kind of thing, because it's only gonna gradually get worse at this point. I'll put a timestamp on screen if you want to rejoin us. If not, if this is just too much of a heavy case for you, then I'll see you tomorrow. As part of this humiliation, Melinda made Shanda take off her bra and she gave it to Hope Rippy, who swapped out her own bra for Shanda's. So Laurie drove them all to a nearby garbage dump where Laurie and Melinda took Shanda and dragged her out of the car and threw her onto the floor. And once again, Hope and Tony just watched. Melinda and Laurie forced Shanda to strip naked while Melinda began punching Shanda very hard. She also repeatedly slammed Shanda's face into her knee and because Shanda had braces, this really quite badly cut up the inside of her mouth and she was bleeding quite a lot. Melinda then grabbed the knife that she brought and tried to slit Shanda's throat with it. However, it was too dull and she couldn't really do anything. Hope Rippy then got out of the car, held Shanda down as Laurie and Melinda stabbed her multiple times in the chest. Laurie and Melinda then sent Hope Rippy back into the car as the two of them strangled Shanda until she was unconscious. They then put her body in the trunk of the car and told the other girls that she was dead. They probably believed that she was as well. The girls drove to Laurie's house, went inside, all had a drink, they cleaned up and everything because they were full of Shanda's blood and then they heard Shanda out in the car, who they thought was dead. So Laurie grabbed a kitchen knife, went out to the car, opened the trunk and stabbed Shanda multiple times and then went back into the house covered in her blood. She then cleaned up and told the girls all of their futures using rune stones, which I assume is like a natural fortune telling thing. So then the girls devised a new plan because clearly Shanda wasn't dead at this point. They decided that Hope and Tony were gonna stay home at Laurie's house while Laurie and Melinda were just gonna drive for hours until Shanda eventually slowly died. However, multiple times during this car drive, they heard Shanda in the boot crying and gurgling and so they would stop the car multiple times to go round to the trunk and beat her with a tire iron, thinking they'd killed her every single time they did it. But again, she would just make noise. One of these times, the girls remember opening up the trunk, Shanda then sat up, her eyes rolled into the back of her head and she was unable to speak, although she was still breathing. And so the girls just 
beat her again. The girls were driving for hours until the sun eventually came up and then they decided to go back to Laurie's clean up once again because again they were covered in Shanda's blood and when they got home Hope asked about Shanda asking if she was dead yet asking if they would dumped the body and Laurie laughed as she described the torture that they'd subjected her to for the past few hours. And this conversation actually woke up Laurie Tackett's mother who was asleep upstairs. She came downstairs and she was fuming that Laurie had friends over at such a time of night and she demanded that she took them all home. So they all got back into the car with Shanda still in the trunk and they made one final stop. They drove to a gas station, filled up the car, went and bought a two litre bottle of Pepsi and filled that with petrol as well and then they got back in the car. They then drove to a wooded area. Tony stayed in the car while Melinda, Laurie and Hope all got out to finish the eight hours of torture that they'd subjected Shanda to. They opened the trunk and Hope grabbed a bottle of Windex and began spraying it in Shanda's face, in all of her wounds, saying, you're not looking so hot now, are you? The three of them then wrapped Shanda's body up in a red blanket and carried her to that little patch of grass between the wood and the road where her body was eventually found. Hope then poured half of this bottle of petrol over Shanda's body while Laurie lit a match and set her body on fire. They all then drove off in this car, but after a few minutes, Melinda became very paranoid thinking, what if she's not dead? And so they turned the car around, went back, Melinda got out of the car with the matches and the bottle of petrol, poured the rest of it on Shanda, set her on fire again, and then they drove away again. Shanda Renee Scherer's last word was mummy before she was burned alive aged 12 years old on January 11th, 1992. At this point, it was around 9 a.m. and the girls had been out all night and they were hungry. So they went to McDonald's for a breakfast and during this meal, one of the girls made a joke about how one of the sausages that they were eating looked like Shanda's body. Laurie then dropped Hope and Tony off at their own houses while Laurie and Melinda went back to her house. Melinda then called up her ex, Amanda Heverin, and told her exactly what had happened, although Amanda didn't really believe her at all, and so they arranged to meet up later that day. Meanwhile, back at her own house, Tony began feeling her conscience and she rang one of her friends and told her about this murder. But again, she didn't believe her either. Melinda and Laurie then met up with a friend named Crystal. They told her about the murder. She didn't believe it. And then they went and picked up Amanda Heverin. Both Crystal and Amanda didn't believe the story at all until Melinda and Laurie showed them the trunk of Laurie's car that was covered in blood. Shanda's handprints were on the side and her blood soaked socks were still in there. Amanda was immediately horrified. She was so disturbed that she just asked them to take her home immediately. She didn't want to talk to him. She didn't want to see that. But before she went home, she kissed Melinda, her ex-girlfriend that killed her other ex-girlfriend and promised that she wouldn't tell anyone. And that brings us back to the timeline. Not even 24 hours after this murder took place, Tony Lawrence is already at the police station with a guilty conscience telling them everything. So in the early hours of the morning, police went and arrested Hope Rippey, Laurie Tackett and Melinda Loveless. All four girls, despite them being aged 15, 16 and 17, they were all tried as adults and Laurie Tackett and Melinda Loveless even potentially faced the death penalty. Tony Lawrence didn't actually do anything in the attack. The whole time she just kind of stood and watched and that's not me defending her. That is fact. She didn't do anything to Shanda. But what she did do to stand and allow and watch that is still also vile. And she was sentenced for that. However, her sentence wasn't as high because she didn't actually do anything. She pled guilty to criminal confinement and was sentenced to a maximum of 20 years, but she only served nine years of that and was released in 2000. Hope Rippey, for her part in the torture, she was the one that sprayed Windex on her. She held her down as the other girls did things to her. She was the one that poured petrol on her, but she never actually physically hurt her. That sounds bad, but you understand what I mean. She wasn't one of the ones that stabbed her or strangled her or anything like that. So that's why she wasn't put up for the death penalty. However, she was given a 60 year sentence because obviously she was a huge part in this horrible, horrible torture of Shanda. Although 10 years was taken off of that 60 years for mitigating factors, being the fact that she was abused and self-harmed as a child. So instead of 60 years, she was to serve 50. But then she appealed that 
and got it reduced to 35 but only served 14 years of it before being released in 2006. She served 14 years of what was originally a 60 year sentence. As for Laurie and Melinda, they both took guilty pleas to avoid the death penalty and so they were also both sentenced to 60 years each. Laurie Tackett was actually released in January of 2018, so just over a year ago, after serving only 26 years of her 60 year sentence. And Melinda Loveless is due for release in September of this year, 2019. She will have served 27 years of her 60 years for burning and torturing a 12 year old child. In 2005, Shanda's father, Stephen, drank himself to death after going into a really deep depression and alcoholism after the murder of his daughter. And that went on for over 10 years. Shanda's mother said that he tried everything to kill himself other than put a gun to his head. In 2009, the Shanda Sharer Fund was launched and it was basically gonna be a charity that would put two students through school every single year on a scholarship. However, as of 2018, that charity is no longer running. During her prison time, Melinda Loveless has begun training up puppies to become aid dogs for people with disabilities. And in 2012, Shanda's mother, Jackie, donated a dog to Melinda to train up in Shanda's name. She received a lot of backlash for that, but at the end of the day, it's her choice. However, she chooses to deal with her grief is up to her. Her defence was, I know my child. I know my child would have wanted that. I know she would have wanted some good to come out of this, being an aid dog for someone that, with a disability. But yeah, that completes this case. A very, very heavy one. They're not all gonna be quite this heavy. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you leave a thumbs up and subscribe down below if you wanna see some more from me. A huge thank you to all of my channel members. All of their names are on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can just click the link in the description. Or if you're on a desktop, you can click the join button under the video. If you become a channel member, you'll get your name on this end card and you'll also have access to a members only community tab where I will ask for case suggestions, do polls to see what cases come next and you can just have a lot more say in what you see on the channel. But yeah, I hope you're excited for the rest of Valen Crimes Week and I will see you tomorrow. Bye!